Well, hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Dr. Jill Live. I have a colleague and friend that I have known for a long time here today and so excited about our show. Uh, Dr. Tom, who I will formally introduce in just a moment, is full of knowledge and resources and references, and you will all want to get his latest book as well. We're going to dive into gluten-related disorders and autoimmunity and everything related to immune system and the gut. Uh, just a note, if you want to hear previous episodes, you can find me on Stitcher, iTunes, YouTube, wherever you listen to podcasts, and we've got tons and loads of great guests there. But without further ado, let me introduce today's guest. When it comes to getting healthy, Dr. Tom O'Brien's goal for you is making it easy to do the right thing. What a great, great line, Dr. Tom. As an internationally recognized and admired and compassionate speaker focuses focusing on food sensitivities, environmental toxins, and the development of autoimmune diseases, Dr. Tom's audiences discover that it is through clear understanding of how you got to where you are that you and your doctor can figure out what it will take to get you well. Dr. Tom O'Brien is considered the Sherlock Holmes for chronic diseases and teaches that recognizing and addressing the underlying mechanisms that activate and immune response is the map to the highway towards better health. I can't wait to dive into that today, Tom. He, teach, he holds teaching and faculty positions with the Institute of Functional Medicine and the National University of Health Sciences. And I'm sure there's a lot more we could put in that bio, but without further ado, um, welcome and thanks for joining me today. Oh, thank you, Dr. Joe. It's really a pleasure. It's always fun when we can interact. You know, it's like two kindred spirits dancing in the ethers. Absolutely. Absolutely. And it was so fun to, you know, I, I mean, we've known each other for years, but we got to spend a little bit of dedicated time when we both took a group to Switzerland about three or four years ago. And um, yes. that was really special and got to know you at, a, at another level. So today we're going to talk about immune system, gluten related disorders, but I always like to start with story and kind of the why behind you got where you got in medicine. You're a well-respected teacher, speaker, author. Um, how did you get here? What got you into medicine and this trajectory to a functional health? When I was an intern uh, 40, <laughs> 44 years ago, uh, uh, my ex and I could not get pregnant. And I called the seven most famous holistic doctors I'd ever heard of. If I were doing that today, I'd call you and ask your office manager, could I talk to Dr. Jill, please? So I did that with the leaders at the time. And I asked them all, what do you do for infertility? They all told me what they do. I wrote it all down. Do you know what a category one is? Uh, no. Well, learn. Okay. Category one. Right. And I put a program together and we were pregnant in six weeks. Wow. My neighbors in married housing, we lived on campus yeah. and they had been through artificial insemination and nothing had worked. You know, they'd spent tens of thousands of dollars, you know, that that rabbit hole that unfortunately so many couples have to go down. Yeah. And they asked if I'd work with them. And I said, well, you know, I don't think anything here is going to harm you. Sure. They were pregnant in three months. Wow. So now we are four months pregnant, just hot to trot and ready to tell the world. So we tell our friends and our friend's sister in Wisconsin, you know, we were in Chicago, I was in school in Chicago. Our friend's sister in Wisconsin drives down and I'm treating people out of my dorm room, right? Wow. You're not supposed to do that, right? But I was. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, um, you know, there's not much in medicine that's all or every, but this was an every. Yeah. Every couple having reproductive concerns of any type whether it was infertility or recurrent miscarriages or premature ejaculations, every single couple as a component of what was contributing to their problem was that they were eating foods that they didn't know their immune system was responding to producing inflammation. Yeah. And, you know, we know 14 of the top 15 causes of death, according to the CDC are chronic inflammatory diseases so irrespective of whatever you're dealing with, it's chronic and you need to deal with the inflammation. Yeah. And when I wrote a chapter in our friend Mark Houston's integrative cardiovascular textbook, I pointed out that it was 1986 when science identified that atherosclerosis is a chronic inflammatory disease. It's an immune system disease. So the cardiologist is stuck now with two lines of thinking they have to do. They have to treat the acute condition that's presenting before them, and that's what they're trained to do in cardiology. But then they have to have a different line of thought. Where is the inflammation coming from? 
Because if you just put a stent in, you know, the average lifespan of a stent's about five years and you need a new one because the mechanism is still going on, creating the, the atherosclerosis. So our cardiologists have to think about how do I reduce the inflammation for this patient? And that's true with our neurologists and our pediatricians and our gastroenterologists. 14 of the top 15 causes of death are chronic inflammatory diseases. So you don't want to just treat the symptoms. You have to treat where is the inflammation coming from. You have to investigate. And then it becomes really clear, wow, I have to deal with mold. Well, I don't feel bad when I'm in my house. Well, doesn't matter how you feel if that's the mechanism causing inflammation in your body. So that's how I got into all of this. Amazing. And you know, it's funny because I remember back when I was first in practice practicing functional medicine, I had a 42 year old woman. She had been infertile and never even thought about it, but I treated her not thinking about the fertility. I got a call several months later. She was actually angry. She said, Dr. Jill, I'm pregnant with twins. Now later it ended up being the best thing that ever happened to, to her, you know, and she's so happy yes. my praises, but at the moment she yeah. was not expecting it. <laughs> right, right, right? Right. And and I learned my lesson. I'm like, okay, I have to consult patients as you get well and you do these things and you, you clean up your diet, you might get pregnant. <laughs> right. Just be, <laughs> be prepared. Story. Right. I, I had the same experience I've, I've had, you know, I was a chiropractor. And so yeah. I, I also dealt with mechanical care. And I've had the experience with people, with uh, women with amenorrhea. Mm -hmm. And as I treated their mechanics, their yeah. pelvics, their sacroiliac joints, I say, now just be aware that this care might start your flow yeah. again. Because uh -huh. I had a couple of people that were really angry. They walked right. out of the parking <laughs> lot and their cycle came. You know, it's <laughs> Okay. <laughs> exactly. When things work, the whole body works. Um, right. That's but exactly. I love your story because it often is these problems that we face that um, conventional system maybe hasn't given us the solutions to that we want to go deeper. And you're a seeker, you're a curious. I just uh, recently read and studied and wrote in my book about curiosity. Curiosity is the number one factor to genius and discovery. And no surprise because you're curious, I'm curious, but these things lead us to discover there's more. So let's dive into, first, let's talk about the gut immune connection. Like why would the foods that we eat trigger immune inflammation, autoimmunity, and all of these things that lead to many, many of the chronic conditions that we see. Yeah, sure. It's ancestral. Uh, you have the same body as your ancestor thousands and thousands of years ago. You know, our kidneys work the same. Their hair follicles grow the same. Your gallbladder works the same. The immune system works the same. And the number one threat for our ancestors First, their, their number one goal was to find food, foraging. This is before agriculture, mm -hmm. was to find food. So uh, number two was shelter. Number three was safety. Number four, reproduction. That's arguably the priority order of our ancestors. So they find something to eat. First thing they do is they sniff it. Then they nibble. So we've got smell and we've got taste. Then they eat it. And if there was pathogens in that food that they were eating, bad bacteria that they couldn't identify, it's the job of acid in the stomach to kill anything. But if it can't kill it, if it can't kill it, and this bad guy gets out of the stomach into the small intestine where food can now get into the whole body, then we have sentries standing guard. And I like to think of the British soldiers at Buckingham Palace, you know, those big hats on that are so stiff, they just stand there. Uh -huh. uh, but don't mess with those guys. We have sentries in our immune system in the gut called toll-like receptors. And they're watching everything that comes out of the stomach. And if there's anything that shouldn't be there, they immediately, within five minutes, do two things. One, they increase the protein zonulin which means leaky gut. Why? Because when you get a leaky gut, water comes into the intestines and it's like you got mud stuck on your driveway. You turn on the garden hose and it doesn't wash off. So you put your thumb over the opening of the hose and you get a spray. Now you wash the mud off the driveway. So zonulin increase brings water into the gut to wash out the, the threat. That's the first thing that the sentries do. The second thing is they activate uh, NF-kappa B, the major amplifier of inflammation in the gut. So you get this washing out 
and you get this inflammation in your gut because the, the most common threat for our ancestors, and that's the body we've inherited today, the most common threat was what they ate and what they drank. So that protective mechanism is, we, we still have it. Mm -hmm. And those, those that didn't have well-functioning toe-like receptors, they died and they did not reproduce. So those that had good defense mechanism, a good sentry standing guard, activating that immune response, they survive, they thrive, they reproduce, and that's what's passed down to us today. Now, the reason why I'm doing all that is because there is one food and only one food that does that every single time you eat it, and that's gluten from wheat. Wheat does that. And at Harvard, they're, they're teaching this, and they say that wheat is misinterpreted as a harmful component of a bug. That toll-like receptor standing guard inside your gut, watching everything, when it sees wheat, it fires, it activates that whole response mechanism, leaky gut and uh, increased inflammation. And it happens, Maureen Leonard, a gastroenterologist at Harvard, very famous gal, she did a literature review of over 60 studies on this topic, and she published in the Journal of the American Medical Association in 2017. That's six years ago. And she said, this occurs in all humans who consume gluten. Mm -hmm. Every person, every time they eat it, whether they feel it or not, they get leaky gut and they get increased inflammation in their gut. That's why wheat's a problem, whether you feel bad when you eat it or not. Mm. So such a great analogy of really what's happening inside our gut. Because many people are like, oh, I feel fine. It's no big deal. So what kinds of conditions, I I'm, I'm, I think I know where you're going to say where you're going to go here, but what kinds of conditions, what kind of people that would see you or talk to you about this, would you recommend go off gluten or how well, would they go about right, that? Right, right, right. And uh, um, I, I never say everyone should go off gluten, never, because mm -hmm. uh, I sound like a nutcase, like a fanatic. But mm -hmm. I say everyone that has a health concern should be comprehensively tested to see, is your immune system fighting wheat? Mm -hmm. And that test is called the wheat zoomer because you zoom in on the problem. And like you, I traveled the world teaching. I'm on stage all over. And at the breaks, I go down to the vendors and I look at the laboratories through their manuals of their test. No one has a test that compares in the Western world. I've not been to China, uh, mm -hmm. so I don't know there. But no one has a test that compares with the wheat zoomer. So everyone should be tested comprehensively to see, is your immune system fighting wheat? Mm -hmm. And if it is, you're done, yeah. you're done. By the way, wheat is the only food where I can find the science that when you've crossed that line of tolerance and your immune system says no more with this, no more, when you cross that line of tolerance, you produce memory B cells, which just like a, a childhood vaccine mm -hmm. for the MMR vaccines or DPT, vaccine, mm -hmm. that you have memory cells. So if you're ever exposed to tetanus later in life, yeah. you've got a memory cell. So wait, that's a problem. Let's fight that right now. You produce memory B cells to wheat. Yes. We don't produce memory B cells to egg or to dairy, but we do to wheat because it looks like the structure of it looks like a pathogen, a microorganism. So the, the entire immune system of humans is designed to protect you from bad bugs. Right. And wheat is considered a harmful component of a microorganism. And one more time, this is what they're teaching at Harvard Medical School right now. It's so yeah. cool. Yeah, this is science. I mean, that's the best thing is this is very science. This is not on the edge. This is like solid now. Finally, after all the years we've been working towards getting the data out there and you're one of the leaders there. Let's talk just a little bit because we do have practitioners that listen too. Obviously, we know like on a lab core quest or hospital lab, we can get TTG, IgA and IgG and kind of the basic. Tell us like the weed zoomer. Love that test. Why is that different from your classical celiac test? And really then after question. that, let's also talk about the difference between true celiac and non-celiac gluten sensitivity, those two things. Re really good, quite very important that we all cut our teeth learning about the poten potential dangers of wheat with celiac disease. Mm -hmm. Right. And so the, the historical misconception 
is that if you don't have evidence of celiac disease, you don't have a problem with wheat. That's a misconception because it was celiac disease by which we learned wheat can be a real problem, life-threatening problem. And so you have to test for celiac disease. That's TTG. Yeah. And that TTD chest by itself is not very good either right. because it's only highly sensitive and specific, meaning very accurate, when you are at the end stage of celiac disease with total villus atrophy. Mm -hmm. If you're at the earlier stage of celiac disease, the accuracy of the test, the sensitivity and specificity is about 32%, meaning mm -hmm. it's wrong seven out of 10 times. Yeah. Say, so, no, you, you don't have celiac disease. Well, you may, it's just an earlier stage that TTG is very accurate when you're at the end stage of celiac. But once again, celiac is how we all learned about the problems with wheat. But our friend, professor, and, and teacher, Yehuda Schoenfeld, mm -hmm. the godfather of autoimmunity, and to give the listeners a sense of who is this guy. And I, I see the sun is shining in right through my eyes here. Uh, so uh, I'll just leave it be. I'm not going to go over okay. there to change it. Um, can, but Sean, we well, actually, maybe I will. Yeah, I'm just no going to. No problem at all. Just a Got it. Hey, everybody. I just stopped by to let you know that my new book, Unexpected, Finding Resilience Through Functional Medicine, Science, and Faith, is now available for order wherever you purchase books. In this book, I share my own journey of overcoming life-threatening illness and the tools and tips and tricks and hope and resilience I found along the way. This book includes practical advice for things like cancer and Crohn's disease and other autoimmune conditions, infections like Lyme or Epstein-Barr and mold and biotoxin related illness. What I really hope is that as you read this book, you find transformational wisdom for health and healing. If you wanna get your own copy, stop by readunexpected.com. There you can also collect your free bonuses. So grab your copy today and begin your own transformational journey through functional medicine in finding resilience. No more. Here is Dr. Tom back to talk to us. I just okay. uh, did a little interlude about if you're dealing with autoimmunity or you're dealing with some of these inflammatory conditions, stay tuned because yes. this is really yes. important. Yes. So Professor Schoenfeld, and to get a sense of who this guy is, when I interviewed him for our betrayal docuseries on autoimmunity, at that time, that was 2016, so a few years ago, 28 of the medical doctors who went back and got their PhD in immunology from Tel Aviv University in Israel, mm -hmm. or many more, many more, but 28 chair departments of immunology in med schools and hospitals around the world. They're his students. Yeah. This is the godfather. Wow. And he just published a paper in March of last year of the effects of gluten-free diet on non-celiac autoimmune diseases. And he did a, this is from Schoenfeld. Right. They did a, they did a literature review and um, they said that 79% of the patients get better. And this was confirmed in 64% of the studies on a gluten-free diet. And the most common autoimmune diseases that benefited were the, the most common one was Hashimoto's thyroid disease mm -hmm. with over 80% got better. Psoriasis, it was in the 60 percentiles. Inflammatory bowel disease in the 60 percentiles. But they listed all of the autoimmune diseases, uh, pancre autoimmune pancreatitis, um, cardiac, uh, cardiomyopathies. The list went on and on and on of all of the autoimmune diseases that may get better. Yeah. on a gluten-free diet. And actually the accurate word is probably get better because 79% of the patients got better on a gluten-free diet, irrespective of what autoimmune disease they had. So if you have any autoimmune disease, you just need to do the wheat zoomer. You just need to check, is my immune system fighting wheat? Because that likely is a contributor to the inflammation mm -hmm. I'm currently having that is manifesting as alopecia yes. or psoriasis or whatever the autoimmune disease is. You just have to check. So 
I uh, love this, Dr. Tom, because it's so straightforward. And it, I love that you bring the data, you bring the science. We're talking about leaders and research. We're not talking about esoteric things here. The right. data is clear. I just want to tell you a short little story. You know some of my history, but I had Crohn's disease at 26. A year later, I uh, completely went off all gluten and literally over the several years of healing my gut, completely cured that Crohn's disease. And I eventually... The autoimmune, I always say I collect autoimmune diseases, but all of them are in remission because I'm off gluten and have dealt with yeah. the gut dysbiosis. So it's yeah. real. I'm like standing here as a testimony to confirm yeah. that. Um, what about, I'm going to go on a little tangent because I think it's important. I've heard you talk about this liver. Liver is your like filter of the blood from the gut, right? And the liver is affected. And I'm wondering how many people out there maybe have some autoimmune hepatitis or just a fatty liver. How could that be related to this topic of gluten and the gut? Well, anything you eat, if you drop an apple on the ground, you pick it up and you wipe it off and you eat it, and there's some dirt on the apple, anything you eat, when it comes out of the stomach into the intestines, there's only one place it can go. It gets absorbed into the bloodstream. It goes right to the liver. Mm -hmm. Your liver is an oil filter. It's got over 500 functions that have been identified now, but the primary one, it's an oil filter. And if you think it's like a honeycomb and each of the honeycombs is lined with cheesecloth mm -hmm. so that when the blood comes from the gut straight to the liver with whatever you've been eating, it goes through these honeycomb, these cheesecloth honeycombs to filter any garbage out mm -hmm. that shouldn't get into the body. And then the blood goes out the other side to the rest of the body. So every time you eat wheat, you activate this, this NF-kappa B inflammatory mechanism in your gut, those inflammatory molecules go into the blood to the liver. And those inflammatory molecules, they're like gasoline on the fire. So you start to get inflammation in the liver. And what does that look like? Increased liver enzymes. That's why Mayo Clinic writes the papers that talk about this. They're great papers. There was one from November of 2007 uh, in the journal Hepatology, which means liver diseases. And it was called the liver and celiac disease. Wow. And in there, they talk about increased liver enzymes may be the only presentation to celiac disease. Everything else can be fine. People think they're fine, but you get a blood test with increased liver enzymes, you must just rule out that it's not a reaction to wheat. It's that very common that that could be the traitor. Mm. So just to clarify for those listening, I think you've made it really, really nice and crystal clear, but pretty much any of you out there suffering from autoimmunity, um, rheumatoid yeah. arthritis, yes. any itises, lupus, Crohn's, colitis, um, multiple sclerosis, Hashimoto's thyroiditis, and I could name a dozen others, your first recommendation is going to be get rid of gluten from your diet and do the wheat zoomer. Or, yeah, or my, my first recommendation is do the wheat zoomer. Yeah. yeah. And, and if you can't afford to get the test done for some reason, then do what I do. And I believe you do also gluten-free, dairy-free, added sugar-free, yep. that that's the basics yep. you start with for any autoimmune disease. But always we recommend do the uh, test, yep. don't guess. Yep. So that, because it's also a baseline because it's looking at 26 different markers of a sensitivity to wheat in that test. And let's make it up. Let's say you've got 12 markers that are elevated, but and then you're doing the protocol and six months later, you check again and you have three markers elevated. Then it's easy to say, wow, I'm really doing great. This is 75% healed. I just need to keep on in the right direction. But if you don't do that first test where you had 12, but in six months you're feeling better, but not quite right. So it's all right, I'll do that Zoomer test now. And it comes back with three markers elevated. The tendency is to say, wow, everything I've done for the last six months is not working. Well, I better do something complete. No, it's working really well. You just didn't have the baseline to start with to compare to. Right. That's why you want to test, don't guess to begin with, because it's going to take you a year to two years to turn your body or to turn the entire metabolism around. Mm -hmm. And you need biomarkers like temperature gauges on the dashboard. You need to be able to see what's cooking in here. And is it calming down? Is it cal Look, it's calming down. You're 75% healed in six months. Your immune system is calming down. That's exactly what we want. 
And I've heard you describe, again, you do so well with word pictures to make things easy to understand. And I love that um, about a pearl necklace is like this chain of glutinous long and I'll let you describe it. But I think that's helpful. Tell us about that because what we're looking at with the sweet zoomer is like the pieces of the chain, right? Like we're looking that's at exactly with right. the TTG, we're looking at one little piece. So right. describe that for the listeners a little bit more about how that might relate because we're looking at a lot more than just one part of the gluten molecule. You bet, you bet. Mrs. Patient, your intestines are a tube the digestive tract is a tube. It starts at the mouth. It goes to the other end, about 25 feet long, winds around in the center there, you know. Uh, the inside of the tube is lined with cheesecloth. When you eat food, think of proteins like a pearl necklace, and the acid in your stomach undoes the clasp of the pearl necklace. Now you have a string of pearls. And the job of our enzymes is to act like scissors to cut the pearl necklace into smaller pieces. Snip, 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 snip. And those pieces are called peptides. Smaller snip, 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 until you're down to each pearl of the pearl necklace. Now as that food's moving down from the stomach into the intestines, each pearl can go through the cheesecloth into the bloodstream. And your bloodstream is just a highway. You know, everything's going in the same direction. There's no lanes of traffic. Everything's bouncing into each other, but it's just a highway, right? Mm -hmm. But now you've got these pearls that are building blocks on the highway. So your brain cells can make, you, you, you can make new brain cells. You've got all the raw material. You make new bone cells. That's what the amino acids, the pearls of the pearl necklace are for. But when you, and the problem with wheat is that nobody can break it down into the pearls of the pearl necklace. No human. Mm -hmm. The best we can do is snip it into clumps called peptides. Mm -hmm. And that's why it looks like the outer surface of a bug when it comes out of the stomach into the first part of the small intestine, because it looks it's the same amino acid structure as the outside shell of a bacteria. So a toll-like receptor, the guards standing there say, that's a bacteria. And they activate this whole immune response to it. But what happens when wheat comes out, because it activates its immune response, you also get this inflammation in the gut, NF-kappa B and all the cytokines that are formed there. And that inflammation in the gut tears the cheesecloth. Mm -hmm. When you tear the cheesecloth, now these larger clumps, these peptides of wheat or any other clump uh, gets through the tears of the cheesecloth before it's supposed to be able to get through. And they're called macromolecules big molecules. Now they're in the bloodstream and your immune system says, what the heck is that? I better fight that. Now you make antibodies to chicken yeah. or to tomatoes or to raspberries or to any other good food because the tears in the cheesecloth allow the macromolecules to get through into the bloodstream and your immune system trying to protect you creates this systemic inflammation in your bloodstream because these macromolecules are in there from the leaky gut. Yes. That's why they're teaching at Harvard right now, all disease begins in the leaky gut. Mm -hmm. That it's the macromolecules getting through into the bloodstream that activate this immune response systemically through your whole body. And then depending on your genetic vulnerabilities and how you lived your life, that's called antecedents. Sorry for the geek words, but, yep. uh, and what, what that means is you eat tuna fish two, two to three times a week, you got mercury toxicity because all the tuna fish, almost all the tuna fish has mercury in it. And that's an antecedent. So depending on your genetics and your antecedents determines where that inflammation is gonna manifest. Yes. Is it rheumatoid? Is it psoriasis? Is it alopecia? Is it Hashimoto's thyroid? It doesn't matter. The mechanism is the same. All disease begins in the gut. So you have to, Focus at least some of your attention on stop throwing gasoline on the fire. Stop yeah. creating the inflammation, irrespective of what disease you've got. Mm. Gosh, love this as always, Tom, Dr. Tom. And, <laughs> and one of the things that's so interesting is, you know, I talk about mold all the time. Mold is one of the biggest inducers yeah. of leaky gut as well. So if you are out there listening, my audience who has been exposed to mold, know someone with mold, this is very relevant to you as well, even if you don't yet have an autoimmune disease. Now, I want to talk specifically about gluten in the U.S. versus gluten overseas, because I get a lot of questions about what if I go to Italy? I mean, you lived in Italy right. for a while and, and it is different, 
But let's talk about that because obviously we do have more contaminants. We have more pesticides. We have more glyphosate sprayed here. We have more bread uh, wheat that has higher gluten, but still it's wheat is wheat, right? Tell us more about how that works as far as can yeah. you go to Europe if you're not celiac and eat gluten? No, no, not, not if you cross the line That's of tolerance. Yeah. But And here's the reason why. Science tells us, you just read the science, it's really clear, that when you have immune system responses to wheat, mm -hmm. it activates an inflammatory mechanism somewhere in your body, wherever the weak link in the chain is. You know, you pull it a chain, it always breaks at the weakest link, your heart, your lungs, your liver, wherever your weak link is, that's where your symptoms are going to happen. So that comes from the proteins in wheat. Mm -hmm. But the, the GI complaints, the bloating, the gas, the, the uh, constipation, the diarrhea, the GI complaints mainly, not exclusively, but mainly come from the FODMAPs in wheat. It's the fermented carbohydrates in wheat. And so when you eat wheat, if you get that at bloating, that's probably the FODMAPs. But when you eat wheat, you feel fine. But the next day you got a migraine. That's the proteins that's triggering that inflammatory response. And in Italy and Europe, the wheat in Europe is lower in FODMAPs. Mm -hmm. And so you don't get that bloating response, that gaseous response. Yeah. Oh, I can eat the wheat in Italy and I feel fine. Yes. No, you can't right. because the immune system is still reacting. And your MS, if that's your weak link in your chain, is still being fueled or your Crohn's or your yes. rheumatoid, wherever your weak link is, you're still consuming the proteins that activate the immune response systemically, not just in the gut. Yes. So you're saying there's this uh, immediate response. We can literally have sitting at the table, like bloating you and button your pants. Yeah, like, yeah button your pants bell. and all that. Right. And because right. it's associated with your meal, people think, oh, if I don't feel bad, I'm okay. But you're saying no. no, it could be the next day or the next day. Or even I've had that a lot of patients go where they consume whatever they want. And they come back and like inflammation markers are off the chart. They felt okay as far as gas and bloating and bowels. But what they didn't notice until they got back was their immune system went Exactly. You know, yeah. I've had so many patients say, Doc, uh, my tests are better. I'm normal yeah. now and I'm staying away from wheat. I've really got the system down how to do this, but we're going to Italy. Yeah. Can I eat the wheat over there? Because I'm told that you don't feel so bad. And I'll say, no, here's why. And yeah. they go, oh, well, I said, but if you're going to do it anyway, yeah. and they smile a little bit, I say, let's do the test right now just to confirm everything is great. And your, your, your myelin antibodies for MS or your Hashimoto's for thyroid, the antibodies are down in normal ranges. Everything is calm. Then go to Italy, do what you want and come back and we'll do the test again. Yeah. Never has a patient had a normal test when they come back. Not yeah. once. I, I would agree. And I want to go one step further with a leaky gut because people are like, do I have leaky gut? 20 years ago, when you and I first started, um, we, I would do some of the lactulous mannitol. There were tests out there. There still are the tests for leaky gut. I'll tell you, Dr. Tom, now I assume every single person walking in my office has some sort of leaky gut because our toxic load, the types of food, the dirty air, dirty water, I say clean air, clean water, clean food. Well, all those things are contaminating our systems. Right. Would you say it's, do you test for leaky gut or do you assume people have leaky gut or where are you at in that? That argument and where's well, the more important right, right the beauty behind that question is that when this laboratory vibrant wellness came out in 2015 they opened up with this new technology mayo clinic called it a new era in laboratory medicine a new era and i'm looking for my phone here mm -hmm. and i see it so i'm going to grab it here Perfect. because if i had told you in 1995 that you know in 20 years or so, 25 years, I'm going to hold this little black thing in my hand about the size of my wallet, maybe a little bit bigger. And if I just push a couple of buttons here, I can tell you within five to 10 seconds that the air particulate matter in Spiazzo, Italy is 70 today. Do not exercise outside. That in Chicago is 41. That's good. San Diego's 44. That's okay. But San Antonio's at 72. Do not exercise in San Antonio today. I can tell you that in five seconds. In, in other words, I've got the encyclopedia of the world in my hand mm -hmm. here. If I had told you that in 1995, you would have thought that I was watching too much Star Trek. Yeah. Right? <laughs> the same has happened in laboratory medicine. The technology has improved dramatically. And it's called silicone chip technology. 
And this laboratory has the patent on this technology. So I read the paper in January of 2016 from Mayo Clinic that said, and this is their language, a new era in laboratory medicine where testing for wheat sensitivity has 97 to 99% sensitivity, 98 to 100% specificity. And I went, whoa, yeah. <laughs> like this, like my two-year-old son, yeah. whoa. whoa. <laughs> <laughs> and so I went to visit the lab and it, it's, you have to wear a spacesuit, literally a okay. spacesuit when, when you go in there because it's dust free. They're dealing with silicone chips mm -hmm. and they look at 26 markers of a sensitivity to wheat with that kind of accuracy, not one marker, not two, 26. And on top of that, because they were really smart business-wise to be competitive in the world out there, they included in the wheat zoomer the most accurate test for intestinal permeability. It's on the same test. And so you get both, the best of both worlds. You identify the number one potential gasoline on the fire in our diet today. You identify it if it's a problem for you or not. And you can identify, do you have leaky gut right now? And I fully agree with your assumption that um, um, all autoimmune patients mm -hmm. until proven ever, uh, otherwise have a leaky gut because that's the gateway in the development of autoimmune diseases. Wow, this is just jam-packed with pearls. That's yes, all. I know. <laughs> Literally, <laughs> I love it. Um, no, super good information. So let's kind of end with a couple little things. First of all, an autoimmune patient walks in your office or you're, you were talking to them. Obviously, we're going to test them for the wheat zoomer, check for gluten sensitivity and take them off. What would be a couple of the things, like what other steps would you think about with autoimmunity in the gut that you might want to look at? or or? Yeah, that's a really good question. The um, uh, uh, there's two answers to this. The first answer, and most important, if there's only one thing you're going to do, Mrs. Patient, only one thing, it's build a healthy, diverse microbiome. That That is the best protection you can have in the world against any autoimmune disease. Of course, stop throwing gasoline on the fire, whether it's mold or foods or whatever it should be. Uh, you have to identify and get that gasoline out of there. But then how do I rebuild? How do I get a stronger system? Build a healthy gut. That's critically important. That's the first thing. And the second thing on the gluten-free diet, the primary talk I'm doing this year around the world mm -hmm. uh, is uh, I've titled it The Enigma yes. of a Gluten-Free Diet. Reduced Symptomatology and Increased Mortality. Mm -hmm. Now, the word enigma means that doesn't make sense. And what I just said in the follow-up sentence, reduce symptomatology, everybody, not everybody, almost everybody feels better on a gluten-free diet. You know, a couple of weeks, your belt's going a notch tighter because you're losing weight. You're not so bloated. Your energy's up. You sleep better. Your child's seizures have reduced, you know, whatever the symptoms are, reduce symptomatology, but increase mortality. And when you read the science on this, it's jaw dropping and no one's reading that science. In the Journal of the American Medical Association, they looked at um, 350,000 endoscopy biopsies. That's when you put a tube down uh, into the stomach, pass the stomach in, into the intestine, snip out a little piece of intestine and look at it under a microscope. And so th this is from Sweden where they've got socialized medicine. You know, they got records on everybody. And so they... Um, Patient went to a doctor, the doctor referred him to a gastroenterologist, the gastroenterologist did an endoscopy biopsy. They found 39,000 celiacs in that group of 350,000, okay. And then the rest of them had colitis or Crohn's or cancer or nothing that they could identify, but there were 39,000 celiacs. They followed these patients for 25 to 30 years. Mm -hmm. How did they do? How many people die? When did they die? And all of that. And they found that if you were diagnosed with celiac disease, you were twice as likely to die early compared to any other disease. Twice as likely. And that was, that was like, what? Yeah. But that's the only autoimmune disease we know what to do. Stop right. eating wheat, right? But still they died early. Then more important in my opinion, they showed that if you were diagnosed with celiac, you had an 86% increased risk of death in the first year from a cardiovascular incident 
compared to the other 300,000 people. 86% compared to the colitis patients, compared to the Crohn's patients, compared to the cancer patients, 86% more likely to die of a cardiovascular incident and 3.87 fold increased risk of dying from a cancer in the first year after diagnosis compared to any other disease. Mm -hmm. And that's like, what? Mm -hmm. What? I mean, that's just jaw dropping. And there are now eight studies that I have in my all day course for healthcare professionals on mortality and celiac disease. So they really understand this. Now, why does that happen? Well, what do they do after being diagnosed with celiac disease? What's, what's the recommendation? Gluten-free diet. Gluten-free diet. What else? Yeah. Absolutely nothing. The way the gluten-free diet is being done kills people, kills more people. That you can't substitute these gluten-free crap products, yes. excuse yes. me, Yes. for the wheat products that you were eating. You have to learn how to do it correctly. That's why we just launched a 30-day hands-on over 40 videos of how to do gluten-free diet correctly. Okay. And you know, it's on our website because you, if you learn how to do it correctly, you thrive and all of those at-risk numbers just go away. They all go away. But if you don't know how to do it correctly and you go to Starbucks, you say, oh, they've got gluten-free muffins. I can have one. It's healthy for me. As a matter of fact, I can have two. They're healthy for me. No, they're not. They're just not poison for you. But what happens when you don't do a gluten-free diet correctly, 80%, depending on the study, 78 to 81% of the prebiotics in the Western diet come from wheat, from the arabinoxylans in wheat. Not everything in wheat's bad for you. So when you go wheat free and you substitute the gluten free products that are just white paste, they are not prebiotics, then all of the good guys in your gut who have for years and decades lived on the wheat food for prebiotics, now they're gone. They start to starve and die off. And the pathogens, the bad bacteria that love the white paste sugary stuff, they thrive on that. So what happens in eight months to a year, you've completely changed your microbiome. And every study shows that when you look at the microbiome of healthy people, put them on a gluten-free diet in 30 days, their microbiome is much, much worse than it was before. The good guys have gone down, the bad guys have gone up, the diversity has gone down because they don't know how to do a gluten-free diet correctly. So gluten-free diet is the best thing you can do if you do it correctly, and you have to know how to do it correctly. Uh, love this data, so, so important. And especially because what's so common is you want your your want your brownies and your pizza crust and your cookies and your crackers, and then you go gluten-free and you're like, well, I still want all those things. That's you go right. out and you buy the gluten-free processed version. We're back to process. So, and I couldn't agree more. Diversity is king with the yes. gut and we have to feed that microbiome. This is why even like a low FODMAP diet, which can be a game changer with SIBO, is not a long-term solution because they you are eliminating all the food for your good bacteria and increasing diversity. So I love, love this. Um, I want to honor your time today. So I want to ask where people can find you, but before we go there, give us one last synopsis pearl. What would you leave people with that are, and, and let's assume you're out there struggling with autoimmune disease and these things we're talking about. What's the, what's the last bit of wisdom from Dr. Tom? I think uh, Dr. Joe would agree with me on this, that it's really wonderful when people know they have a diagnosis of an autoimmune disease. That's wonderful. And if you read my book, The Autoimmune Fix, you understand the mechanism is the same. So what we need to do is show you the map so that you can then get on the highway to get back to health and get back to higher levels of health. The, the diagnosis of, of an autoimmune disease is not a sentence for the rest of your life. You can improve your body function in any condition that you have. The body wants to be healthy. You just have to stop throwing gasoline on the fire and release the emergency. You don't, you back out of a driveway and you say, what's wrong with this car? It's moving, but not oh, the emergency brake. Uh -huh. And you let go of the emergency brake, right? You just have to stop throwing gasoline on the fire and release the emergency brakes because your body wants to be healthy. It wants to thrive. And you just have to find the map, your map for your body 
from your history, from your lifestyle, from your environment. And when you find that map and your doctor lays out for you, usually a functional medicine doctor, but others can have this overview also. When you find this map and you're not just dealing with, well, this will help you feel better right now, which is important that you can function better, but you're also going down that other pathway to reduce the inflammation, you build healthier cells. That your blueprint, your genetics is for a healthier, vibrant you. And there's just emergency breaks holding you back from building healthier, vibrant cells. So the goal is stop throwing gasoline on the fire and release the emergency breaks holding back your rejuvenation. Mm. Brilliantly said. And what you're describing, which you also describe in your book, The Autoimmune Fix, um, is the fact that we are told what's incurable is really not. We actually yeah. have something called reversible autoimmunity, and that's what we're talking about today. So where can people get your book? Where can people take the course on gluten? Where can people find you, Dr. Tom? Oh, thank you. It's the dr.com, the doctor.com. Just don't spell the word doctor out, the dr.com, and everything's there. You'll find the gluten course, and it works really great. And by the way, anything you get from us, if you if practitioners do the gluten-free uh, certification program, anything, you're not happy, send us an email, no questions asked. We'll give you a refund, you know, on anything. It doesn't matter. You know, we're not here to like sell to make a, you know, it, we're here to help you, but I have to pay staff and everything else, right? So we have to make some income, but you'll see that it's all very reasonably um, structured for you. But if you're ever not happy at all, we always take care of you. Oh, brilliant. And you are a great resource. If you're listening, I do highly encourage you to go check out the doctor.com. Check out Dr. Tom stuff. He is just a, just a pillar in our community, Dr. Tom. And it is oh, such a know. treat to have you here today. Thank you, uh, my friend, for coming on. Thank you, Joe, Dr. Joe. It's a pleasure to be with you always. And like I said, you know, we dance in the ethers together so <laughs> easily. It's really fun. Thank you. It is fun.